so we are in this series called What Would Jesus Undo? And, uh, you know, we, many of us have the bracelets, or maybe we don't wear them anymore. Uh, what would Jesus do? We're asking last week and the next three weeks today, and then two more. What would Jesus undo? And last week we looked at that Jesus would undo spiritual indifference. Spiritual indifference. Uh, interesting the feedback that I've gotten from that uh, from that message. Uh, I think it hit a nerve for a lot of us. Um, it hit a nerve for me as I wrote it <laughs> and prepared for it. Is that we are? Because I think just with life and everything we've experienced in the last 19 months, and I and I saw this creeping into the church even before that, but I think it's been escalated in the last 19 months that we have. Um, we, 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 it's so easy for us to become different. And I would encourage you, if you've missed that talk, that you would watch it online. There are questions for, from now on moving forward with every message that we bring. There will be a resource online for you to use personally uh, that you can engage in this so that, it's, so that it helps it land a little deeper. So we talked about spiritual indifference today as we've been looking at. I think Jesus would want to undo meaningless worship. Meaningless worship. And this is something I know uh, during, it was back in April, Kevin and Kelly uh, White did a series on worship. And if you missed that, I ask you to go back and listen to that. Because this hits on this a bit, but I, I just find that while we, were, while we were looking at what would Jesus undo, I felt we had to have a conversation about worship, about meaningless worship. I think it's so important for us, especially those of us, like, and, and one thing I, I love about the bridge is that we are such an eclectic group. I mean, we've got, like, people coming from all different varieties of church background. We have people that, that have no church background. We have people that have been Christians for years, people that are Christians that are new in the faith, and, and we have people that just don't know if they want to actually commit to this yet, <laughs> and, that, and I think that's awesome that we have such, a, such an eclectic group that gathers here. But worship really is a significant part of our lives. It is, and Jesus actually, he talks about it. it the word worship doesn't come up um, specifically all the time. But so often as Jesus engaged his followers, so often as he addressed the crowds and looked at the Pharisees and and remember that everywhere Jesus went, there was the tax collectors and the, and the, and the sinners. Uh, there was the, his disciples and the religious crowd, the Pharisees, that followed him everywhere. And so much of what he talked about really addresses what worship looks like for us if we say that Jesus is our Lord and Savior. And if you're on the outside looking into this going, I don't know about this Jesus thing, I don't know about committing my life to this, this is a, you can get a glimpse through here of what this looks like when we make a decision, or should look like, when, it, when we make a decision to follow Christ. We're going to look at some statements today, and this, and this message is going to land, I hope, very practical. I want to talk practically about what it looks like to have a life of worship. And we're going to look at a passage now, if you have your Bibles, Turn to Matthew 15, and we're going to look at where Jesus hits on the crowd. He's addressing the Pharisees, but everybody's listening to what he's saying, and he is talking about what worship is. Then some Pharisees, this is in verse 1, uh, Matthew 15, 1. Then some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, Why do your disciples break the tradition of elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. How many of us wash our hands before we eat? How many did that faithfully before COVID? <laughs> of course, the doctor would. <laughs> I have to. I have to admit, like I, my own personal hygiene has has drastically improved in the last 19 months. Um, and, uh, my, and I, if my wife was here, she would probably say that's still not saying a lot. But, <laughs> I actually looked in the mirror before I came today, so that's a step in the right direction. Um, 
Here they're talking about they don't wash their hands before they eat. And this has nothing to do with hygiene. This has nothing to do with, for them, about, about just making sure that your hands are clean before you eat. For the Pharisees, this was ceremonial law. This was, this was ceremonial cleanliness. And for them, this was a big deal. For Orthodox Jews, it still is, that things are either clean or unclean. There is no gray area in this. Animals are clean or unclean. There's, there's ways to prepare your food that's clean or unclean. People with bodily discharge, open skins on, or open sores on their arms, they were unclean. Um, pigs were unclean. Mice were unclean. And then if you touch something that was unclean or something that was unclean touched you, you were ceremonially unclean. If, for example, if a mouse, unclean, touched a cup, and then the cup is now unclean. And if you, unknowingly, you didn't know that the mouse <coughs> brushed up against that, you touched the cup, now you are unclean. And then you reach over and give your spouse a kiss on the cheek, now your spouse is unclean. And this is how they function. And if you, once you are unclean, you had to, you cannot worship. You cannot, you have, no, you have lost all your connection with God. So you have to be ceremoniously clean if you are going to worship. And so this hand, I'm going to try to go through this. This hand thing, washing that they did and still do, was very regimented. First and foremost, you would have to hold your hands, like sleeves up, you would have to hold your hands like this. And then they would, I gotta, I gotta, they would pour a quarter of a log on, of water on you. Now we think, that's a lot of water. A quarter of a log? That was a log. Thank you. I'm glad you asked. A log is, get this, one and a half eggshells full. And I'm like, what size egg? <laughs> is that medium, small, extra large? Is it like double yolk? It? And and so, but they would. So that was the measurement. So it's not a lot of water. So you picture the amount of water you could get in one and a half eggs. And they would pour that somebody, and the water had to be clean. I couldn't find out. I researched. I couldn't find out how the water got clean, but it was clean water. And and they would. You had to stand like this. And the water was poured, and if the water wrote, poured, if it ran, it had to be poured in such a way so that it dripped down, not touching you or anybody else, because it had to hit the ground, and then you can't step in that because that's unclean now. So, right? So, and, and if it poured down your arms, you had to start again because you're still unclean, right? Because that unclean water actually got off your hands. And then you turn your hands over this way. And they would pour more, and then you wipe, and now you're clean. Providing it did not touch you or anybody <coughs> else. Okay? This is what they're talking about. And for the devout Jew, they would not only do this at the beginning of a meal, they would do this between every course. So imagine, you know, you have your salad, and you do the business, soup comes, you do your business, you know, like... You go out and grab a burger, right? <laughs> you got your fries, you got your burger, you got your milkshake. Got to have my fries now. <laughs> and a burger. I mean, my goodness, right? Like it's just that that's what they do. And so this is the process that they're that they're talking about. And you stop and you go. And so this is they the Pharisees couldn't care less about the people. It's all about the law. And they say to Jesus, they don't wash their hands before they eat. And then when you read on, Jesus just loses it on them. He, he just unleashes. And there's a section in there that we're not looking at, going to cover today, where he's talking about how they convert, how they work the law, how they manipulate it for their own gain, so that they can actually get out of even looking after their parents. And so it's just very interesting what was unfolding here. And Jesus loses his mind on them and says, you hypocrites, 
That word hypocrite, pay attention to that, because that's what we're talking about next week. You hypocrites, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. And that word vain means without success. It has no result. It is useless. So picture this and pay attention. Jesus is we're more concerned about the heart than he is about what's going on on the outside. He's saying to the Pharisees, you guys are more focused about doing this all right, making sure that water doesn't, drop, doesn't land on you, than you are about what's going on on the inside. Therefore, your worship is useless. It is meaningless. If, if the inside is not right, I don't care how good you look on the outside. I don't care how many rules you keep, how many laws you obey. If the inside is bad, there is no, no connection here. Your worship is useless. And when we think of worship, and I appreciated hearing what people said, because it is important, I, like, and you know, I, hope it, I hope people weren't offended by that parody, uh, because we talk about this, right? Like we talk about when we, when we worship, it really is about God. And it's not, it's not about us. And, and we pay attention to what we say. Because that changes us. That transforms us. And, it, you know, and when we gather like this, and I, I love how Jen brought that out, and just even for the different, how different perspectives, there is more to worship than song. And yet, we have these defaults that I see us, and, and this is why Jesus would undo meaningless worship, because... Left unchecked, we have defaults, so when we think worship, we just lock into something and say, well, that's worship for me. And there are, whether, I mean, just to acknowledge this, that, I mean, when it comes to worship, there are different environments. There are different environments when it comes to worship. Some people would prefer, and I, I had this, this critique about the bridge, oh, I can't go there. Because it, it, they just seem so disrespectful to God. They're, they're actually talking before the service. I, I've had people say that. This isn't a quiet place. This is not it. And, and we're going, and you go, interesting. Because I think fellowship is part of worship. <laughs> I think community is part of worship. But for this person, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm like, okay, so you do you. There are churches where that, you know, that, where you can connect better then. Because the environment speaks a lot to how we worship. Some people prefer the, like in a church in a corporate setting, some people prefer the, the, the reverence, the quietness, the, the where there is like a holy hush. And I believe there are moments where we need that. The psalmist says, be still and know I'm God. I believe that there are moments and, and, that, and we need to experience that individually and corporately where, where we have that environment. But the environment is, is crucial for a lot of people when it comes to worship. Some people would say, oh no, we can't you know, forget the quiet. Let's have the loud, you know, the, we need drums, and we need electric guitars, and we need smoke machines. And we need, you know, it's just night and day. Each one of us, we can experience environments that create worship in us. And for us, there are different expressions that we talk about. I mean, Psalm 95, verse 6 says, David, in the psalmist says, sometimes we bow before God. Psalm 63, uh, verse 4 says, sometimes we lift our hands in adoration. Psalm 149, verse 3 says, sometimes we dance in celebration. This boy won't dance. <laughs> Aww. No. <laughs> if you saw, you wouldn't be going on. Like, yeah, you don't dance. <laughs> but it's a form, it's a form of worship. And 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 when and I've seen it, I've seen celebration through dance that has moved me. That has caused me to worship more significantly, if that makes sense. Sometimes, Hebrew, the writer of Hebrews, Hebrews 13, verse 5, says, Sometimes 
we worship with the sacrifice of praise. And we can go on here with the list. Like there are multiple environments and, and there are multiple expressions of how we worship. Have you ever asked, what is the right expression? What is the right environment? Yeah, I have. There's an answer. You want to know what the answer is for the right expression, the right uh, uh, environment? Spirit and truth. Huh? Spirit and truth. Spirit and truth. Okay, no, so, uh, yeah, but you're right. But when you think of all these expressions and all these environments, what's right? All. There's your answer. Or none. See, this is the thing about worship. All expressions are right or they're not. All the environments are right or not. It depends if the heart is right before God. It does not, if your heart is not right before God, it does not matter what you do or how you do it. And this is where for us that Jesus would undo meaningless worship because worship is not limited to the songs we sing. It is about the life we live. Worship is not about the style of music. It's about the condition of your heart. And that is here and not here. The condition of your heart should transfer every, it, it should transcend everything that you're involved in. But it doesn't. The condition of your heart shouldn't change just because you walk through a door and you put on your church face. The condition of your heart to worship Him in spirit and truth is the same no matter where you are. The question is, is that true of you or is it true of me? In my daily, you know, like, is this a daily thing that I experience? You know, we need to understand and we need to embrace that being a Christian, being a follower of Christ, is not a label. It is not a hobby. It is not something that we fit into our schedule when it's convenient. It's our life. It is our life. Therefore, worship is our life. Because it's always all about Jesus. It's always all about God. And you stop, and I have to ask myself this question. I was talking to Kelly and Kelly um, when, when this morning, because they're going to be leading us in a few minutes. And I'm like, I have to admit, I am, maybe this is embarrassing for me to admit, I don't know, I don't know how I should feel. I mean, this week, because I'm preparing to speak on this, before the last few weeks in preparing for this, my, I feel that my life of worship, my life that it is all worship, that it, you can't separate it, has changed significantly. Because of a focus, I mean, this is the thing, like, you prepare for this, you prepare to speak, I mean, you're in it, you're in it, you're in it, and then you go, that really doesn't describe me all the time. And this is kind of my full-time job. <laughs> and that's a gap. And I think when we look at our lives and say, okay, do I agree? You know, I'm going to read this again from my... We need to understand... We need to embrace that being a Christian, being a follower of Christ, is not a label. It's not a hobby. It's not something we fit into our calendars when it's convenient. It is our life. Worship in response to Christ. It is my life. And it's more than music. It's more than prayer. It's more than engaging scripture. It is, it's all of that and more. It is serving. It is, it is every waking moment. Because I'm never not in the presence of God. Right? right. <laughs> so 
So why would my worship stop? Why would I compartmentalize it? It is our lives. So if worship, Jesus says it's the heart, it is a condition of your heart, how is your heart? How is your heart? I, I've got three questions. Or they could be questions. I think they're all questions. They might be statements. I've got three statements, questions, that I'm going to put up on the screen. And again, these will be on our website by tomorrow night. And I would, last week, I said, here's, a, here's an exercise. Ask yourself how you're doing with indifference. Here's a simple exercise. How is your heart? If our heart is connected to our worship, how is your heart? First question in this heart check reads this. It says, in my daily... In, well, let's jump to that in a second. In my daily relationship with... Is my daily relationship with God priority in my life? Like there are, I believe, and some people like they kind of like, oh. if this is how we are to be, and if Jesus says I would undo meaningless worship, if worship is our life, if it's connected to the condition of our heart, and again, some people push back, and this isn't regimented. What I'm looking at is daily practices. I don't care where you do it, how you do it, when you do it. But I believe that as Christ followers, there are daily practices that we engage in that inform the head and change the heart. And this is how we grow. This is how we see the transformation in our lives. And to start, when I think of this, I have to ask myself, is my daily relationship with God priority in my life? If it is, can I see your calendar? Can I see where, how you spent your days this past week? Because if it's a priority, it gets our time. We will find time for anything if it's a priority. So honestly, ask yourself. When it comes to my heart being in a place to worship, is my daily relationship with God priority in my life? Am I willing to endure, endure hardship, hardship for Christ's sake? Am I willing to endure hardship for Christ's sake? We talked about this last week when it comes, when it comes to indifference where you know, God's word is planted in our lives and then we talked about this, the parable that Jesus referenced in, God, in Mark's gospel. Well, not that he referenced, that he told in Mark's gospel about the seed being spread, and it all landed, and depending on where it landed, whether or not it grew, and if it had root. And the, and the worries of life, we talked about that, the deceitfulness of riches, the, it all comes in and chokes out God's word in our lives. Hardships come. Do hardships dictate whether or not your heart is still connected to God? Do hardships dictate whether or not you will worship whether you will still give him priority, whether you will still uh, practice being in his presence and allowing his presence to move through you. And because hardships, how many of us have gone through this week without at least one hardship? Right? It's daily. Differing degrees, differing events, but we experience this. And the question that I ask myself is, am I, do I still move on in spite of the hardship? Am I willing to endure? Do I submit my goals and cares to God daily? This is huge for us, I believe, in North America. Do I submit my goals, my cares, to God daily? I was reading uh, an article by Joel Stoll, some of you, Joseph Stoll, and I love what he said, because this is about choices, right? 
This is about choices. He said, our choices are always revealing, of course. God doesn't need to see. That God doesn't need to wait to see our choices in order for him to know what's in our hearts. <laughs> but the things that occupy our time and attention are telling. As Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. Regardless of what we want him to think of us, the true condition of our heart becomes clear based on how we use our time, our money, and our talents. That's worship. When we invest these resources in the things he cares about, then it reveals that our hearts are in tune with his. And I love how he drew that out, that it is really about the choices that we are making. And the choices that we make determine whether or not we are living a life that is worship, that is pleasing to God. I would say, where God can actually work through us. God's heart is with the needs. He goes on. God's heart is with the needs of people and the advancement of his kingdom. So question, what do your, jo what do your choices tell him and others about where your heart is? You let that land for a moment. What do your choices tell God and others about where your heart is? That's going to be on questions, too, this week. Because that's a good one. That's not just one you can let land for a minute and move on. I think you have to ponder over that one. And think about what that looks like day by day. See, the reality is, people, we will ultimately do whatever is in our heart to do. And Jesus made that very clear. Whatever's in the heart, it's going to come out. So Jesus, it's no wonder that he says, for worship to be meaningful, it's dependent on what's going on in here, not what's going on out here. Paul tells us, so this is another daily practice. Romans 12, verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. You see, daily, we lay down our lives as an act of worship. And I love how Paul tells it, and, and you know, we know this. How many times have you heard that verse? How many times do you apply it? Because, I mean, Paul says, I urge you, and, and, you know, to do this on go. And the language that he uses is not one and done. It is ongoing. To present your body as living sacrifices. And I've heard this before, but the thing is, we're a living sacrifice, and you might, and why do we have to do this? Why should this be a daily practice? If not several times during the day? Because we're a living sacrifice. Unlike the sacrifices that were killed, we can crawl off the altar. <laughs> and we do. Busyness comes in. Distractions come in. And we crawl down and go off to our business and Paul says, no, 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 get back here. Get back here. I was reminded uh, quite a few years ago, we did a series on, uh, called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. And there was a practice in there that we talked about a lot, and said it's called the daily office. The daily office. Where not just as you start your day, but even while you have lunch, and before you go to bed, you put yourself in this place of surrender to God. Because we crawl off the altar. So get back on there. A daily practice of this. Another daily practice that I think is important for us to have this heart of worship, this heart that's connected to God, is the Shema. How many remember that? This really makes me feel good. <laughs> we spent a whole series on it. <laughs> Maybe this will jog your memory. The Shema. 
Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. I want you to say this with me. Okay? And where it says Israel, put your name in. Okay? Ready? So let's go. One, two, three. Hear, O saints, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. several times a day. It's their daily office. It's a way for them to remind themselves that yes, it is about God, loving Him with everything, and then loving others as I love myself. The love I receive. And having these daily practices I think are so important for us. I mean, we gather We gather in community in smaller groups, and we, in the bridge, there's a lot of just groups that just happen all the time, and having people over for dinner, and I mean, my wife and I, we were out on Friday night, we were invited, and the conversation was really good, talking about, you know, there was a lot of laughs, but then there was lots of talk about Jesus, there was talks focusing on him, and, you know, we have these places to recenter ourselves. And this is important. But moving beyond that, to get these daily practices where our heart is not, it, it's not, it's, my heart being right for, before God is not dependent on being in a place. It's not dependent on being with a person. Although those places and people are important. It's dependent on and settled because I'm always in the presence of God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. What would change in your life if two, three times a day you just paused and said, and remember Paul's words, I urge you. I urge you to present your bodies. If you paused and said, Steve, or you're not Steve, but you know what I mean. Steve, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. You have a bad morning, <laughs> and at lunchtime, when you take that moment, your, your coffee break is okay. Lord, the Lord your God, oh, yeah. thank you, thank you, thank you. Now that person doesn't seem so bad. Now that phone call doesn't seem so dreadful. Now that serving opportunity doesn't seem so overwhelming. The other thing that we need to remember is that our worship is not based on our circumstances. It is not based on our circumstances. So often, and I'm guilty of this, and I see it, that we, God, this happened, oh, I can't worship. Imagine what would shift if we moved to the place where our worship is not based on our circumstances. It's based on His it's based on who he is. Unchanging. All loving. Because of who he is, the condition of our heart, this, the, the living a life that's sacrificial, living a life of worship, that whether we are singing, whether we're praying, whether we're corporate, whether we're not, does not change. Because he does not change. Who is God? Who is he to you? He's a teacher. He's a teacher. I'm going to ask you to stand. And Kelly and Kelly are going to come. And you're going to stand if you can. And we're going to read together. 
who God is. These statements are going to come up. And as they come up, I want us to read them. And then, when we're done, I'm going to read scripture. Just kind of pray it as a, read it as a blessing over us. Before we worship him through music. So here, who, if our worship is not based on our circumstances, but is based on his character, read this with me. Who is God? Our God, our Redeemer, our Righteousness in advance, our Strength, our Shield, our Salvation. He is the Bread of Life, Living Water, He's the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. He is the true vine. He is the way, the truth, the life. Light of the world, Lamb of God, Lion of Judah. He is all-powerful, all-knowing, ever-present. He is Alpha and Omega, beginning and end. It's early Monday morning again. Um, I was I'm editing today, and because uh, we had some problems again yesterday, starting to get some things figured out. No idea why all of a sudden we're having these problems. Um, but uh, thank you for continuing to join us. Uh, I hope that as we're looking in this series of what would Jesus undo, that you are personally being challenged. Um, I'm getting a lot of feedback about even yesterday after the service, just how this series in particular is challenging people. Um, and, uh, and it's challenging me because I really believe Jesus wants to undo some things in our lives and he wants to undo spiritual indifference and he wants to undo meaningless worship. And, and I'm more convinced than ever that all of life is worship. You cannot compartmentalize your faith. You cannot 
compartmentalize whether uh, you will follow Christ. Um, it is, you know, you cannot not have him as the center of your life. So as we wrapped up the service yesterday, uh, we worshiped together, and I'd encourage you to pause and take a significant amount of time right now um, to, to focus on God, to focus on who He is, to focus on what He's done for you, and, and really celebrate that. I would encourage you to work through um, this question that we gave yesterday as we wrapped up. We looked at this verse from the message and uh, where, where Paul, in, in, in the way that only he uh, could in that challenge in Romans 12, we, we looked at it from the message as we wrapped up. And I love how Eugene Peterson uh, worded that, the, um, that you take, you know, your everyday, your everyday, everyday ordinary life, you're eating, you're drinking, you're sleeping life, and surrender it to God. That's what we need to do. I would encourage you to engage in daily practices of remembering the Shema several times a day, several times a day, just hear, O Steve, the Lord your God is one, love the Lord your God, etc. I would encourage you to have the daily practice of of several times a day just remembering Romans 12 1. Last week I left you with this question that uh, when it comes to overcoming spiritual indifference that every day do something that requires faith. And here this week as we close the question that we had yesterday and I'm giving to you now is what is worship going to look like for you this week? What is going to change? How is it that you're actually, what are the practical things that you're going to put in place so that daily you experience worship in a meaningful way? Where your heart is changed and it's not conditional on circumstances, it's not conditional on, on styles, it's not conditional on, on, on environments or expressions. It is just who you are. And I'm more convinced than ever that the daily practices that we do in, engage the head to transform the heart. And so I would encourage you to be moving on in that. I look forward to you joining us next week as we look at what Jesus would undo. <clears throat> he would undo hypocrisy. So I hope to see you next week as we continue in this series, What Would Jesus Unto? God bless you, and we'll see you next week.